macroeconomics uh, lecture 22 and we're on the topic of uh, business cycles uh, this is our third lecture on business cycles so during the first lecture I made an overall introduction to what business cycles are and I mostly explained the overall behavior of the business cycle which is mostly let's say related to GDP or to one particular variable in the second lecture what I explained was the behavior throughout the business cycle of a large number of macroeconomic variables I discussed five primary macroeconomic variables and then 13 secondary macroeconomic variables so what we have up, done up to this point is only describe the business cycle we have not tried yet to explain it so what we do now is effectively begin to explain the business cycle now first of all let me clarify some of the literature uh, number one is I have used uh, this book and this book I used for last time the second lecture it also contains uh, most maybe 80 maybe 90 percent of our first lecture on business cycle it's called business cycles by Thomas Hall and it is on reserve so for the first two lectures you can use respectively chapter one and chapter two to prepare from this textbook so far what I have been doing is use this textbook which is called America's Great Depression by Rothbard and I've been using this book to uh, teach uh, business cycles and the first chapter chapter one is positive theory of the business cycle is what you can use alternatively as a reading to business cycles of what we do today and next time it is approximately 34 uh, pages or so chapter one let me read it out loud for you the positive theory of the cycle from pages three to page 36 it is available on reserve and anyone who will be majoring economics anyone who will be majoring economics should read this book at some point in your career now I want to show you the book which I have also taken from the library which is money bank credit and economic cycles this is by Jesus Huerta de Soto and as I told you last time he is from the University of Madrid and I'm using this book chapter 5 for what we are trying to do so it is an alternative reading for you guys and this is where I have gotten uh, the uh, these outlines for the course if you take a look at chapter five bank credit and its effects on the economic system uh, what you have is the first section is the foundations of capital theory and these foundations is what we had in our lecture of theory of capital interest and production then section number two is the effect on the productive structure of an increase in credit financed under a prior increase in voluntary savings this is a long way of saying economic growth in other words credit based or founded on business on savings and is the foundation for economic growth the third section is effects of bank credit expansion unbacked by an increase in savings is effectively the theory of the business cycle what I have made for you is a short outline of this we have four six sections which is not very likely that I'll be able to complete uh, today uh, usually takes about 80 or 90 minutes to complete so I split for an introductory course in two lectures so we'll probably finish somewhere up until the causes of boom for reversal so let's make a quick uh, review of what's going on so far what we have so far is let's see capital and the theory of 
capital. The theory of capital is the founding block for growth and is also the founding block for business cycles. For economic growth, we deal with loan banking and for business cycles we have deposit banking. For growth you have fully backed by savings credit. So credit backed by savings and here you have credit backed by nothing. A better way to say is credit not backed by savings. This type of credit which is not backed by savings we call credit expansion. So credit expansion. So what we will try to do today and next time is show that business cycles are remarkably similar to economic growth but with one single fundamental difference. And the difference is that there is no prior savings. A different way of saying it is that there is no uh, lowering of time preferences or people did not increase their savings to back up the growth. And therefore if banks ex expand credit and expand it based on savings then you get a sustainable growth. But if there is no savings then it becomes a business cycle. You get a boom and you get a bust and today and next time we see why the boom is unsustainable which means why the boom simply cannot last forever. Any questions so far? Anything? Okay, so number one, well let's take a look at the three critical effects that we have during a an economic growth. Oops. So, number one, if you'd remember, higher losses to low order capital goods. So, when you have increased savings, you initiate a process where low order capital goods generate relative losses and thereby resources are shifted from low order goods to high order goods. Second effect is lower interest rates with its widening and lengthening of the production structure. And the third effect is the Ricardo effect. So these are the three fundamental effects that we have when you get prior original increase in savings. Now let's take a look what happens during credit expansion. So number one credit expansion. Why would commercial banks engage in credit expansion? The answer is simple because they will profit substantially more when they engage in credit expansion as opposed to not engaging in credit expansion. In other words, they'd be maximizing profits. So which are the various effects for that? Number one, consumption increases. Why consumption would increase? The answer is simple. 
More credit on the market will mean more or higher overall aggregate income. Understandably, if businesses and people get more credit, they'll spend it. So higher overall income when people's preferences to save have not changed proportionately. For example, they consume 70% of what, they, what their income and they save 30%. In that particular case, if the overall or aggregate income increases, overall consumption will also increase. So, consumption increases. Well, there is an important second effect, and this is interest rate goes down. It is important to understand that interest rate goes down also under regular economic growth when uh, when founded on prior savings. Here, interest rates go down for a fundamentally different economic reasons. As we started before, during the process of credit expansion, there is only one way that credit can expand. And the only way to expand credit is to lower its price. The price of credit is interest rate. So if commercial banks are willing to sell more credits or to expand credit, they must force interest rates down. So here is a stark similarity. Interest rates are lowered with growth. The next one is capital goods prices go up. Well, capital goods prices go up is remarkably similar as with sound economic growth. Why capital goods prices will go up? Reason is remarkably similar. If interest rates go down, then capital goods prices will go up. Capital goods prices, if you'd remember, we discussed a while ago, are inversely related to interest rates. Usually, higher interest rates would mean other things equal lower capital goods prices, or relatively lower, and lower interest rates will mean higher capital goods prices. Capital goods prices are usually associated with stocks and bonds, but they're also associated with real estate, with machines, equipment, etc. So this is also remarkably similar to a genuine economic growth. Another one is illusion of prosperity which is based on profitability. If you would remember, we discussed on our lecture of inflation is that during inflation, there is an illusion of increased or higher profitability amongst businesses. This is typical during inflationary years. Now, let's just remind here shortly that inflation can possibly occur in exactly one of two ways. There is no third way to generate inflation. The first is simply to print money slash banknotes, and this is the one way to do it, or to create inflation. And the second way to create inflation is credit expansion. So, it is important to understand, to realize that everything that we're talking about credit expansion applies in full force to inflation. In other words, now that we're talking with banks initiating credit expansion, means that all of the 21 effects that we discussed during our inflation lecture apply fully. Is that clear so far? Okay, so 
One of those effects of inflation or credit expansion, illusory sense. In reality, they are not. But this increased profitability increases the sense for prosperity. One of the standard effects is to lengthen and widen the production structure. In other words, what the credit expansion does is to provide the same identical signal to businesses and economic agents as if there is genuine economic growth based on savings. So the picture so far looks remarkably similar. And let's see, EF. And the last one, which is again identical, is there is a fundamental shift of resources from low order capital goods to high order capital goods. In other words, a process is initiated whereby you have a shift of resources from low to high order goods, which is identical to economic growth. So, the question now arises, how long will the boom last? Well, the market provides market forces which, after a one shot of expanding credit, the market will reverse all of these effects and return them to the original position. The reversal of this, of these effects, and returning them to the original position is called a bust. So the bust will do that. So how does a business cycle proceed? Well, let's provide an illustration. But banks expand, let's say credit is expanded at 5% and it has a certain effect, all of these effects. Well, after a short period of time, maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe eight months, the effects wear off and then a reversal kicks in and when the reversal kicks in, it's all over with the business cycle in a few short months. So, effects wear off, what banks do? Well, they expand credit some more, maybe at a faster rate of 6% a couple of months later. So, they continue to initiate this process, or let's call it better, to reinitiate this process as if there is savings and as if there is growth. And this continues until it stops, until the process reverses, because there are market forces that will reverse it. Then what would banks do? Well, banks will expand at 8% and repeat this over and over. Next time they'll expand at 10%, maybe at 13 maybe at 17 at 25 40%, 60%, and so forth. In other words, what I'm saying here is not only banks must expand credit to maintain the boom, but I'm saying something substantially stronger. In order to maintain the boom, the banking system must accelerate credit expansion or the growth of credit expansion. Now the question is, why do they have to accelerate? Why is it so important to accelerate? And the answer is malinvestments. During the initial process of expanding credit, there will be certain malinvestments. 
So, if this is the overall economy, I can best describe it with a little pi over here. Let's say better. This is the capital structure. And this little portion here is the portion of malinvestments. Well, if they stop, the bust will reverse the process, will uh, these malinvestments, and it will be back from the beginning. If banks expand at 6% in order to compensate for this less productive or unproductive capital. So by expanding at 6%, they expand additionally the share of mal investments in the economy. So now a slightly larger share of the overall capital structure is malinvested. Then in order to maintain the boom, you need an even larger growth of credit to compensate for the increased share of malinvestment. So, with each shot, so at 5% it is here, at 6% it is here, at 8% it goes over here, at 10% it goes on here. So, here is one fundamental argument. Each round of accelerated credit expansion makes the overall production structure less efficient, but there is an end to it. And what's the end? The end is making the whole production structure completely inefficient. In other words, a whole production structure becomes one pile of malinvestments. Of course, this doesn't occur because as you increase the share of malinvestments, forces to reverse this boom process become stronger and stronger and stronger. But the point is that there is no way that the boom can last forever because each round must be higher of credit expansion and thereby you add more and more malinvestments. But you don't have the savings to back them up. So that's one way to think about it. This is the so-called thinking in real terms. In other words, in capital. Now there is a completely different argument, a completely different argument as to why the boom cannot last forever. And the argument is a monetary argument. And what's the monetary argument? Well, it is very simple. Credit expansion is inflation. So, first round, you expand credit at 5%. Next time around, you must inflate even more and even more and even more. So, can we inflate forever? And the answer is, if you remember from our inflation lectures on phases of inflation, the answer is no, we cannot, because as soon as people figure out somewhere over here or over here that inflation is here to stay and accelerate, then inflationary expectations will kick in and people will begin to lower their demand for money and then inflation from low will switch to high inflation and then as a result of that inflation will begin to accelerate rapidly. As credit expansion accelerates inflation will begin to, meaning price inflation will begin to accelerate a certain point even higher and the answer is the monetary argument it cannot maintain the boom forever because there will be hyper inflation so hyper inflation will ultimately hold the process it will hold it because hyper inflation in itself means a complete collapse of the monetary system and thereby a complete collapse of the credit system and thereby inability to expand credit any 
further. So, this is one of the reasons why this process cannot last forever. Now we get into some more details before I get into why the market will hold the, hold the process very soon. So, what we get into is, if you would remember, okay, you have a question. Let's see what the question is. Uh, okay, okay, so well, part of it we'll also discuss now. Why it does so is because it fools people into thinking that they're real, good, genuine sales. So they initiate a invest high, but those investments cannot be completed. In other words, the production structure, in order to be completed, once you start building out from the back, you need a lot of capital to build out the production structure. Let me try to draw a picture of this so that maybe it will help. So, this is the production structure as it is. It provides a signal, it provides a signal, and the signal is through higher sorry, through lower interest rates and higher capital goods prices. The signal is to widen and lengthen the production structure. So, there will be some investments here. And then, there will be some investments here. And some investments here, here, and here. If the overall widening and also some investments here and here, if there is sufficient capital to build the whole structure all the way to the end, then everything is perfect. The, pro the, the problem is we cannot build the structure all the way to the end. Why not? Well, each of these pieces requires new additional savings. So, Investments equal savings, and they even equal them by definition. So, you start building out new capital, you definitely need the savings underneath. Well, you say, well, how can we possibly start to build out the capital on the back if savings didn't increase? Well, one answer is, if you'd remember, we divert those resources from low-order capital goods to high-order capital goods. When you divert the resources, it can work for a while. Once you start building out from the back, at some point, you cannot divert resources from the, from the beginning, but you don't have the savings. And if you ha don't have the savings, you cannot complete the whole process till the very end. Uh, for example, you can think of it, Bulgaria is a small country. We have a small GDP, 20 billion euro. And we're thinking of uh, building, let's say, a nuclear reactor. And that nuclear reactor would cost us roughly between 5 and 10 billion euro. Can we print the euro to begin building the reactor? And the answer is sure. It's a simple way to expand credit to begin building the credit reactor. But what will be the problem? We can build billions, sorry, we can print billions, or we can print trillions, but we cannot get the bricks to use to build the reactor. We cannot get the uranium to get it started. We don't have all the steel to get it complete. So once you begin to think in terms of steel, concrete, bricks, and all the other capital that is needed, we simply do not have that capital. We haven't saved it. We haven't increased our savings in order to do that. So all of these processes which are not based on savings and you try to widen or lengthen at the very back end are doomed to failure because there is enough savings. Is it clear? All right, so I was, where was I? 
I was at Mass Entrepreneurial Air. So, we are, or I am getting to answer the question why there are, there is a cluster of entrepreneurial errors during the boom. Remember when I was explaining that usually entrepreneurs are remarkably skilled at forecasting the future. And usually these are the best forecasters. So during the boom, what turns out to be the case is that suddenly these entrepreneurs at the end of the boom is revealed that all of them made mistakes in error. So let's see for a moment what would fool those businessmen into believing that this is a genuine growth when in reality it isn't. Well, the first one is point numbers entrepreneur. Take this one. I don't have three hands, guys. All right, so two, mass entrepreneurial errors. Why would they occur? First, we said illusion of increased profitability. In other words, they do get higher accounting profits. And the higher accounting profits fool them into thinking that they actually have higher business profits. So remember, profits had one critical function in an economy. And that function is to signal that the business is good, that the business is profitable, and that you should invest more in it. So, illusion of profitability sends the wrong signal to entrepreneurs. That is one of the fundamental reasons why they're fooled throughout the boom into making investments that will turn out not so profitable. Now, the second reason is a wave of optimism. Usually throughout boom times, and boom times are the exact opposite of a bust time. A bust time has been called historically a depression, simply because people feel depressed during the depression. And during the boom it is the exact opposite. People feel overly optimistic. There is a massive wave of optimism, which by the way, it's typical today in Bulgaria, which was remarkably typical when I was in the U.S. in 1997, 98, 99. Phenomenal wave of optimism because the boom had lasted for nine years. There was that general feeling that the boom will likely last forever. So this general wave of optimism makes people sorry, businessmen and entrepreneurs be less cautious and thereby more willing to invest without considering the possibility that there may be a bust in the recession in how they'll handle that bust or recession. So that's the second fundamental reason that fools entrepreneurs. The third one is pretty much related to the other two, is a sense, sense of prosperity. There are higher profits, there are higher wages, there are higher salaries, there's overall optimism. People feel more prosperous and they feel that prosperity is here to stay for a long time. So, again, they invest more. Another reason is related to the process of maladjustments. And the process of maladjustment is similar to the process of malinvestment. In other words, 
maladjustment is essentially investing in a line of business that seems to be profitable and appears to be profitable but in reality it will turn out down the road that it is not actually profitable and will actually turn losses. So, this is another reason managers invest. They see it profitable, but down the road it will turn not to be profitable. And there is another one which is temporal or intertemporal this coordination. If you would remember, as I was explaining, temporal coordination meant building out appropriately the whole capital structure all the way from low order capital goods to high order capital goods in a very harmonious manner. Well, the low interest rate distorts this coordination process. If you remember from the theory of capital, we said that it was the interest rate that created or caused the harmony of intertemporal coordination in the capital structure. Well, if you forcefully lower interest rates through credit expansion, it will send the wrong signal and intertemporal coordination will turn out to be sometime down the road to be actually a, an intertemporal discoordination. So, entrepreneurs think that they're building out appropriately the capital structure, but they are fooled by the artificially lower interest rates. So, these are, let's say, the five fundamental reasons as to why there is a massive wave of entrepreneurial errors down the boom. Now we get to the very heart of business cycle theory and the very heart of the business cycle theory is a relatively simple concept. Let's see what your question is. Well, it's maladjustment in general is referred to one particular investment which will turn out eventually down the road not to be profitable. Intertemporal coordination refers to the whole capital structure from end to end. You may think of the capital structure, let's say, of the internet. It refers to the speed of your network card, first of all, to the speed of your processor, the speed of your network card, the speed of your line, then there is an internet ring, uh, well before that there is your internet service provider. In other words, you may increase tremendously the capacity in one portion of this let's say capital structure of internet providing but unless you increase the capacity in each in every way along the chain of delivery from the website server all the way to your computer then you do not really have proper coordination so interest rates provide signal of optimally providing this capital structure so Coordination refers to the whole capital structure in general. This refers to particular investments. Is this answering? Okay, so we get to the heart of the subject. And the heart of the subject is, if there is a 5% shot of credit, well, any percent, 5 or 8 or 7, whatever, why the market will force a reversal? Why a free market will reverse the whole process. The key is always the same because ultimately there aren't enough savings. So what we do now is discuss section number three which is causes of boom reversing to bust. 
In other words, how would the market force a credit expansionary boom to turn into a bust? Well, you have here now, now six different causes for reversal. So the heart of this whole lecture is to complete those six uh, different causes. So what we'll do is discuss them, and they will be, in a sense, uh, some of the hardest part of this macroeconomics course. Usually it takes a whole lecture to cover them. Hopefully I'll be able to cover, to cover them by the end of this lecture. If not, we finish up to where we finish, and we continue next time. So, first of all is factor prices increase. In other words, uh, prices of labor go up, prices of capital go up, prices of bricks, prices of cement, prices of lumber, all of these go up. Well, what are the reasons? So, reason number one, I just shorten it with R1, is that there is higher monetary demand for factors. In other words, credit expansion means that everybody's purchasing power increased simply because money supply effectively increased, in other words, through inflation. So people have more money to spend, and they'll also spend on higher order capital goods. They'll spend effectively on factors, labor, capital, etc. So their prices will go up, nothing really fancy. But there is more important reason, and this is the key reason, is that no resources are freed from low order capital goods. Remember, we genuine savings, and that's the key here, we genuine savings. Demand for consumer and low order good falls, and that fall in demand releases effectively resources which will be transferred. Now there is no low demand, and if there is no low demand, resources are not released. If demand increases but no resources have been released, the result is higher factor prices. So this is the key difference from economic growth. This is why, or one of the ultimate arguments as to why savings matter, because higher savings will release resources. Okay, so what do we have? We have consequences, number of consequences, and consequences is that project costs go up, and they go up a whole lot more. In other words, investors having more and more credit start bidding up the prices of bricks, of cement, of lumber, of copper, of whatever resources they use. For example, in the U.S., 98, 99, 2000, and especially in 2002 and 3, when there was a real estate boom, there was shortage of Mexicans. You know, Mexicans are cheap labor used in construction. So, eight dollars is what a Mexican construction worker will get paid. And suddenly, 2003, 2004, there's such a wild construction going on that if you really want to get a Mexican to work for you, you've got to pay him ten dollars. Well, that's an example of resource prices going higher. Copper. There was a perceived shortage of copper. Of course, there was no shortage. It was just scarcity. People had to buy at a twice and three times higher price. So, well, guys, please stop talking the two of you, okay? Or just split together. And you get the penalty point, too. All right, so prices get higher. There is perceived shortage of copper. Well, you just got to pay twice more, otherwise, at double the price. There is plenty of copper. So this is an example of factor prices increasing. Well, if that's the case, if you build a garage or a shop or whatever you're building, you're expecting one cost, but cost can run up on you 20 or 30 percent because 
factor prices run higher on your 20 or 30 percent. And what's the ultimate result? The ultimate result is that the price of your investment turns out to be way higher, way higher, to the point where you say, wow, I thought it was going to cost me to build this little garage, let's say $100,000. Now it costs $150,000, and you realize that it's no longer profitable. Well, if factor prices increase to the point where it's no longer profitable to invest, then the investment boom is over. And so the bust begins. Is it fairly clear now? All right, so that's number one. Number two is consumer prices go high or, or increase. Well, why is that? Well, the monetary income of factors increased. In other words, people get, like Mexicans working for $10 an hour rather than $8 an hour, they have a higher income. So they go be buying more consumer goods. Why would they be buying more consumer goods? And here is the key, because their savings pattern and savings propensity did not change. Because their savings didn't change, their higher income will imply higher consumption. We also said that early on that consumption increases, so they'll drive consumer prices higher. That's a simple, fundamental reason to do so. Well, that's the reason number one. Uh, let me try to clean the board over because I'll need it. But there is a fundamentally different reason to do that. Remember, during economic growth, there was a temporary slowdown in the production of consumer goods. And the production of consumer goods was associated with what? Lower demand. And the market responded accordingly. Now, however, there is no lower demand for consumer goods, yet production of consumer goods slows down. So the second reason why consumer prices must increase is because the lower production of consumer goods makes consumer goods relatively more scarce. Okay, let's write this out. Two, reason one is higher monetary income of factors. For example, during the dot-com boom, dot-com entrepreneurs they were making IPOs, they were making millions of dollars. They'd be buying Porsches and Lamborghinis and Ferraris and whatnot. They had substantially higher income, so they'll drive prices of whatever luxury goods they consume higher. Reason number two is temporary slowdown of production of consumer goods. That's the second reason. Okay, so what are the consequences for that? Well, the first fundamental consequence, and it is key because it's going to play the role there, is that consumer prices rise faster than wages. This usually happens at a certain point in, a, in the advanced portion of the boom. In other words, during the early revival portion, this doesn't happen. But once the boom advances, prices begin, or price increases begin to outstrip increases in wages. This is extremely important because it has a consequence out of that, and this is that real wages 
what? Fall. In other words, Mexicans might be getting from eight, they might be getting ten dollars, but their electricity will not go up by twenty, whatever, five percent, go up by thirty or forty percent. Their gasoline that they're consuming is going to go up by forty percent. The house they're willing to buy is going to go up much higher. The rent for their apartment that they want to rent is going to go much higher. So that's an important consequence. So that's number two. Eventually, this will also reverse the boom, but we got to get a little later. So that's number two. Let's discuss now number three or cause three. A any questions so far? Is it fairly clear? Does it make sense? Okay, so low order capital goods profitability rises substantially. Why is this going to happen? What's the reason for low order capital good profitability to rise? Yes, because consumers. So the reason is that consumer prices, prices of low order capital goods rise real fast. So naturally, their productivity will rise. Well, if productivity of low order capital goods rises and rises a lot, what does it mean? Pro production will rise. Investments in low order capital goods will rise. So remember, the boom meant that we shift resources from low order capital goods to high order capital goods. Well, once prices begin to accelerate, profitability of low order capital goods will send the exactly opposite signal. High order capital goods are not as profitable as low order capital goods. So the reversal process will be signaled through higher profits to reverse and shift back from high order back to low order. So this is the heart to understand the business cycle. You let the market work its way, it's going to force back those investments made in the higher order and resources to go shift it back. So the result of this is a consequence will be again shift shift resources from capital goods which we call high order consumer goods to consumer goods or low order capital goods. So this is one key way to reverse the boom. Here, the key way to reverse the boom in the first case was that the investment becomes so terribly expensive that it's not worth investing anymore in that sector. So investments can like dry up because the resources that you use are so expensive. Uh, any questions so far? We are done up to three. Any more questions? Is it clear? All right, we move on to four. Well, four is the Ricardo effect. Do you guys remember what was the Ricardo effect from economic growth? Well, during economic growth, real wages went up. Remember, during genuine economic growth, savings increased, consumer demand fell, consumer prices fell, wages remained the same, and if consumer prices fall, this simply means that real wages increase. If real wages increase, this means labor becomes more expensive, capital becomes relatively cheaper or cheaper relative to labor. So there will be more capital intensive. In other words, we'll be substituting labor for capital. Well, here the Ricardo effect works in the exact opposite way. Why? During genuine growth, backed by savings, 
Real wages increased. Well, what happened here? Real wages went down. So that's why we use number two, because it's got an effect on four. So, reason is that real wages fall and of course the consequences that you will use now the cheaper labor rather than capital. In other words, you will no longer widen and lengthen the production structure. To widen the production structure meant what? You use more capital per worker. Well, if work or labor is relatively cheaper to capital, now you switch back and you use more workers rather than capital. So this represents a reversal of the boom. So the consequences use more labor. In other words, make the capital structure less labor intensive. Sorry, more labor intensive, less capital intensive. Okay, so that's number four. Well, let me try to clear and have cause number five. We have about 15 minutes to finish today, and I should try to do that. Okay, so cause number five. Well, let me see how I'm going to do this. Number five is interest rates rise. Interest rates rise. Now, let's review quickly what were the three fundamental components of interest rates. You should remember now the article on capital and interest. Remember what were the three components of interest rates? All right, component number one was real interest rates. In real interest rate, we also called pure interest rate. What was the other component of interest rate? Well, well, the, the question is nominal. Which are the co three components of nominal interest rate? Uh, index for what? Uh, price kind of purchasing power. So we have purchasing power component, which we sometimes call inflationary component. In other words, a compensation for inflation, right? And the last one was component for what? For risk. Okay, so you get a shot of credit expansion. The boom progresses. The question is why would after artificially pushing down the interest rate why the market will push it back up? Well, the answer is because each of the three components will go higher. Number one, credit expansion must accelerate. First at 5%, then at 6%, then at 8%. So as credit expansion accelerates, so do inflationary expectations. So. The inflationary expectations as the boom progresses will continue to increase. So the first year they're going to be 1%, the next year going to be 3%, the next year they're going to be 5%. They're going to be higher and higher and higher. So this will drive up the interest rate. Well, what about real interest rate? Well, it's very simple. It represents availability of credit or availability of capital for investment purposes. Well, as long as the credit expansion continues on and on, there is plentiful credit. It will keep the pure interest rate down. 
the minute the credit expansion stops, credit suddenly becomes relatively scarce. In other words, it was growing at 5%, 7%, 9%. What happens if it grows at zero? Well, it's extremely scarce suddenly. If it's extremely scarce suddenly, the pure interest rate will reflect the scarcity of capital. So that's one reason. Well, a boom turns into a bust. And during bust, there are higher unemployments, there are more bankruptcies, there is a general, generally perceived higher risk. So once the boom is over, high risk premia are factored in to interest rates. So it turns out that once the credit expansion is over, whenever it is over, we said sooner or later it always ends, you have each of the three components rising and this means that the interest rate will shoot up to the levels before the credit expansion uh, you know, started. Moreover, they'll shoot even higher. There is another, yet another reason why interest rate might rise even higher. Well, the reason is that you have a lot of hotels, like the one that's built outside. And if they've built maybe three, maybe four stores, but it's a 10-story hotel, entrepreneurs will be desperate to get that extra credit just to complete their original investment. In other words, as the boom progresses, you have progressively larger share of investments that have been begun but have not been yet completed. Well, all of those investments that are not yet completed, suddenly entrepreneurs will rush to outcompete each other for the scarcer credit because they'll be desperate to beat up as high as necessary just to complete the investment rather than lose it all, the result will be that they will drive interest rates even higher than the interest rates before the boom. So that's yet another reason why interest rates will go higher. Now remember that during economic growth and both during the beginning of the boom, interest rates were pushed artificially higher with a whole bunch of consequences. Well, once credit stops, interest rate rises for these three particular reasons. It will reverse everything that has been begun during the boom because of the higher interest rate. So that's number five. And there is the last cause number six, and this is losses in high order capital goods. It turns out that if you get to look at causes one, two, three, four, and five, you add them all up together, the ultimate result will be losses in high order capital goods. So losses in high order capital goods or relative losses, losses relative to the low order capital goods will mean that resources will be shift, shifted from high order capital goods to low order capital goods. So the point is that each of these six except for two will effectively function as a reversal of the process of the boom back to the old order when there was no credit expansion. But two we use specifically for real wages later on in the Ricardo effect. So these are the fundamental reasons why the market left on its own without credit expansion will put back everything into order. So let me summarize a little bit what we did so far. What we did so far was say that credit expansion caused 
the business cycle. Then we said that credit expansion caused the business cycle to function in a way quite similar to economic growth. We also said that it fools entrepreneurs into thinking that a genuine economic growth has occurred because it provides to entrepreneurs and consumers alike the same signals in terms of prices, in terms of profitability, in terms of interest rates. And then we said that as long as credit expansion continues, the boom continues, but it must, credit expansion must continue at an accelerated rate. Well, as credit expansion proceeds, you have these six fundamental reasons that kick in, each time stronger and stronger as a reaction to credit expansion. Sooner or later, these six jointly overwhelm the credit expansionary process. That's why also each time credit expansion must be accelerating faster. This year you accelerated credit of 20%. All of these work together. They get to overwhelm those 20%, so you gotta expand credit of 30% if you will sustain the boom. And then they work even stronger when they have 30%, so you gotta expand the 50 or 60% to maintain the boom. So, what we said so far is that there are forces that ultimately reverse the boom. And then, when the reversal overwhelms the credit expansion, the bust begins. So, what I have next time for you guys is discuss or describe as a second part to this le lecture what the crisis is and what the depression is, or what characterizes these two, and what is necessary for a depression in order to say that the depression is over. In other words, which are the things that's got to occur during a depression in order to say that the depression is really over? Any questions that you may have? Any questions? Okay, so losses in higher order capital goods. Well, first of all, let, 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 let's try to, to clarify a, a number of things. Okay, so first and foremost, factor prices increase. For example, it's 1999. You want a computer, internet programmer, web programmer. Web programmers would cost $150,000, $200,000 before they would cost sixty dollars or $80,000. So if your costs increase, meaning skyrocket, necessarily it will result in higher factor prices. So again, that, that's one way to think about it. Number two is uh, while factor prices increase, actually services or revenues for these high order capital goods do not increase. For example, let's consider 2007. You have in the United States a, or has just begun, a real estate bust. Let's say why or how do we think, for example, houses would be an excellent example of high order capital goods. Well, costs of housing have gone sky high, okay? You, you got to buy, you know, Mexican labor, it costs 10 or $12, you got to buy copper, etc., etc. So the cost is extremely high. At the same time, housing prices fall. Housing prices fall. So number two is capital goods prices fall. Why capital goods or housing prices may fall? The answer lies, and I'm trying to find it in interest rates going down in 
five, sorry, going up as interest rates increase, housing prices become more and more and more expensive. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Interest rates increase, housing prices fall. So the point is that every time interest rates go higher, the result is always that capital goods prices go down. This applies for stocks, this applies for bonds, this applies for real estate, this applies for machines, this applies for equipment, for everything. So factory prices going up is the one. So costs go higher, the capital goods prices go down, uh, but there is yet another reason, and another reason is that low order capital goods become so profitable that they get to steal resources from high order capital goods. In other words, the production of high order capital goods is no longer so attractive because now it is better to be in the business of low order capital goods. So that's yet another reason. In other words, this is, rather than saying absolute losses, this means relative losses. In other words, the relative profitability has fallen. So that's a different way to say relative profitability of high order capital goods to low order capital goods falls. The relative profitability. It falls also because the relative profitability of lower the capital goods has increased. Okay? And also for the Ricardo effect, but that, I think that's pretty much good enough. Essentially, at least, you can also find it in the textbook. You can also find it in the textbook. 7 o'clock now, and we're done for today. So next time we'll continue with the crisis and the bus. Okay.